Amen. Take your Bible and open it to Acts chapter 11. Find verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. And if you didn't have a Bible with you today, there's one in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that Bible out and find page 920. 920 and you'll find Acts chapter 11. And we will read in a moment beginning in verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. A message that I've entitled, 4, 3, 2, 1, Go! And in a moment you'll understand why. Before we pray together, let me say that this morning's message is, is just about us. Okay? I just want to talk to us today. I want to talk about some of the things we do and why we do them. I want to talk about what we need to continue to do to be effective, to be relevant in a fast-changing culture and age. So I've checked. There's nobody here but us this morning, all right? So we're just going to have a, just a heart-to-heart conversation about things that, that we do. And as I just told you, it'll follow the pattern of four, three, two, one. And then we will go. We will go out to do kingdom business. So let's bow our heads and would you pray for me today? Would you ask the Lord to use me to speak through me His, His word to you? And then, and then certainly pray for yourself that you can hear that word, receive that word today. So take a moment, silently pray. I'll voice a prayer afterwards. Pray for me. Pray for yourself right now. Father, thank you for the opportunity to just share your word today. I pray that the challenge that is here and that you've laid on my heart to share, I can do so in a way, Father, that would be pleasing to you and that reaches the ears and the hearts and minds of every person who is listening. Father, help us to understand ourselves a little better today. Help us to see ourselves, our congregation, who we are as your people collectively here. And I pray that you would challenge us to be your people in this place. Now ask that in Christ's name. Amen. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. I give my right arm to be ambidextrous. Yogi Berra. Quotes from Yogi Berra, a New York Yankees legend who died last Tuesday at the age of 90. He played 18 times in the All-Star game. He played in 15 straight All-Star games. He appeared in 14 World Series, all with the New York Yankees. He won 10 of them. Can you imagine 10 rings? That's one for every finger. Ten world championship rings owned by Yogi Berra. Three times American League most valuable player. Never earned more than $65,000 a season. What you may not know is that he joined the Navy during World War II at the age of 18. He served from 1943 to 1946. He was on a rocket launching gunboat during the D-Day invasion of Normandy. He began his Yankee career in 1946, right after he got out of the Army, excuse me, Navy. He played until 1963. What you also may not know is that the cartoon character Yogi Bear was named after him. What you may know very well is that he had a way with the English language. Countless expressions, turns of a phrase. They asked him one time about a certain restaurant and he replied, Nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. 
They asked him his approach to playing baseball, and he said, baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. Someone once asked him, what time is it, Yogi? He said, you mean now? <laughs> Yogi also said, you need to always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. <laughs> a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. He also said, never answer an anonymous letter. So those of you that send me anonymous letters from time to time, I don't answer them. And then here's what he said that I want to launch from today. You can observe a lot by watching. You can observe a lot by watching. I want us to observe the first century church this morning. I want us to observe them in action, and I, I want to watch them. And I want us to learn from them and continue to do what they did. Acts chapter 7 is a wonderful slice of life from the first century church. Because you see, the first century church and the apostles, they're in a transition period. That they don't know quite how to navigate. They're in a transition period from taking the gospel to just Jewish people to taking the gospel to Jew and Gentile. And they're trying to sort through what all of that means. Does a person have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? Or can a person who doesn't have any Jewish roots whatsoever, never known the Ten Commandments or Moses or Abraham or the prophets or anything like that, can a Gentile, a pagan, a totally irreligious man simply come to faith in Christ Jesus? And so they're sorting all of this out, trying to understand what that means, the gospel means for the Jew, what it means for the Gentile, what it means for the church as a whole. So let's watch. And observe. Because you can observe a, a lot by watching. Revelation, excuse me, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. If you turn back to chapter 8, if you just want to know the context of this. After the martyrdom of Stephen, persecution broke out among the believers and they begin to scatter outside of Jerusalem. They begin to literally move, leave. They begin to, to, to move out across the known world at that time because of persecution. And Acts chapter 8 tells us about Philip and then Acts chapter 9 tells us about the conversion of Saul and then here we kind of pick back up the story of this persecution that has arisen and the believers have had to scatter and it says here they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch that's a distance of about 300 miles away from Jerusalem that's where they are speaking the word to no one except Jews but there were some of them men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus the Hellenists is a word that means the Greeks the Gentiles the totally irreligious man, as far as a Jew is concerned. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, how do you see the grace of God? We're going to talk about that. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. So, let's begin our life point this way today. Then build them into mature Christ followers. 
Then build them into mature Christ followers. You may recognize that as the second half of our purpose statement. We print it every week in your bulletin. We print it. It's on the front today, right down there at the bottom. We exist to bring Jesus to people and then build them into mature Christ followers. Focus for just a moment with me on the words mature Christ follower. What does that look like? What does a mature Christ follower look like? What, what would one do? Because you see, that's what we're trying to produce here. We're not trying to produce people who just come on Sunday morning and sit and listen to a good Bible study, then move in here on Sunday morning and sit and sing and, and then hear a good sermon. No, we're trying to produce mature Christ followers. So how do we know if we're being successful as a staff? And leadership in this church. How do we know if we're being successful in producing mature Christ followers? What would that look like? What would it look like if you are a mature Christ follower? So, let's go back now and look at our text. I want you to look at these verses. In this passage, there are four rich descriptive words that describe the methods used by the early disciples in the context of the church. There are four words here, and each one of them is significant. I told you earlier that we would follow the pattern of four, three, two, one, go. And so we'll begin with four. Here it is. Four key words. Look at verse 19. You find the words, speaking the word. Your translation may say, telling the message. It means just talking about Jesus. It means living in community with each other, speaking to one another about the things of Jesus. And that's what these disciples who were scattered first did. They just talked about Jesus. Then, look at the next word. It's found also down in verse 20. Preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, that's a more formal word. That is a word that describes an event. That is a more proper word. It is to publicly declare who Jesus is. It is to announce in a worship setting. These disciples preached Jesus to people. Then look down in verse 23. How do you see grace? I asked you that a minute ago. What did Barnabas see that convinced him that these men and women were genuine? Because you see, grace is an, is an invisible quality. But here's what Barnabas saw. Barnabas saw their changed lives. Barnabas saw the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. Barnabas saw the gifts of the Spirit operating in their midst. And he knew that these believers, although they used to be Gentiles, they were never Jews. These people who used to be Gentiles were now full of the same Holy Spirit that he was. He saw the fruit of that Spirit in their life. He saw the gifts of the Spirit operating in in their midst. And he knew these were genuine Christians. So what did Barnabas do? It says there that he exhorted them. That's the third word. He exhorted them. Barnabas encouraged them. He served the Lord by serving these people. He exhorted them to stay faithful to the Lord. He encouraged them to stay true to Jesus. And then look what he did as well. Old Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. And every time you see Barnabas in Scripture, he is encouraging someone. He is doing something to encourage believers. And here's what old Barnabas does in verse 25. He says, you know, I know just the right guy for this place. I know just the right guy. He ought to be the pastor down here at First Baptist Church in Antioch. He is just the right fella. It's been ten years since Barnabas laid eyes on Saul. But he goes to Tarsus and he finds him. Saul, you got to come to Antioch. There's believers there, Saul, that you can use your gift. There's believers there, Saul, that need your ability, that need your grace, that need to know your story, that need to know. And it says that he brought Saul to Antioch. And for a whole year, he and Saul taught, that's our fourth word, a great many people. 
They trained those people how to live for Jesus. They trained those people how to live like Jesus. And it says in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now what you need to know is that's not a name they made up themselves. That's not a name that they got together and decided, okay, what do you think we ought to call ourselves? Uh, let's call ourselves Christians. No, it was a name given to them by the outsiders in Antioch. And it's a term of contempt. It's a term of derision. It means Christ people. It means little Christs. It would be much like someone calling you a Jesus freak today. They're not exactly paying you a compliment if they call you a Jesus freak. The disciples were first known as Christians in Antioch. It's interesting that it is now the most common term for a follower of Jesus Christ, although it appears only two other times in all of the New Testament. The most common word for a believer in Christ in the New Testament is believer or follower. But today in our culture, in our society, we call ourselves Christians. Only three times in all of the New Testament are we called that. And it's a term of contempt then build them into mature Christians Christ followers so we have four key words one means just talking about Jesus the second one means more formal a proclamation a preaching of Jesus the third one is one man is described who uses his gifts to serve the Lord by encouraging others. And the fourth one is described believers who are on the receiving end of instruction. They are being taught and trained in the Word of God. And I submit to you from those verses that we have the total picture of a mature follower of Jesus Christ. When you put the pieces together, you see what a Christ follower looked like. Now here's what a Christ follower does. He lives in community with others. Speaking about Jesus. He worships regularly, hearing the proclamation, the preaching about Jesus. He serves others by using his gifts and abilities. And he studies diligently the word that is being taught to him. So, what does a mature Christ follower look like? I've got it on the screen for you. You worship regularly. You study diligently. You serve willingly. And you live in community. Now, I've rearranged them in that list that you see on the screen for my purposes this morning. Because I want to show you something and then I want to ask you to do something. Because you see, here at First Baptist Church, we challenge you to do those four things. Because we believe that is a picture. The staff, we've talked about this, we've prayed about this, the leadership... If we ask to describe what a person looks like who is maturing in his faith, it would be those four things. You would attend worship services regularly. You would, you would be active in a Bible fellowship, studying God's Word. You would serve in a place of ministry in the life of our church willingly. And you would be committed to a small group where you are living in community with other believers. Now, let me show you how that works. We have some of you that worship regularly with us, and that's all you ever do. It's all you ever do. You're here on Sunday morning at 10.30, I can set my watch by it. You walk in the door, sit down, have a seat. Thank you. I love the fact that you're here. But when this service is over, you will walk out the door, and we won't see you again until next Sunday morning at 10.30. You're a part of the crowd. You're a part of the crowd. And we're glad you're here. We want you to be a part of the crowd. Absolutely. You've made the effort to step from the community to the crowd. And you're here on Sunday morning. And then there's others of you that have taken another step inside. You're part of the congregation. You, you, you are studying diligently. It, doesn't mean, it shouldn't say shares diligently. It should say studies diligently. That means you're part of a Bible fellowship group that meets that meets on at, 10, at, at 9.15 at 
on Sunday morning. And you're a part of that group and you're studying God's word diligently. And if somebody asked you, are you a part of the congregation at First Baptist Church? You would say, absolutely I am. At 9.15, I'm in so-and-so's Bible fellowship group. At 10.30, I'm in the worship service. I'm a part of the congregation. But that's all. It's all. And then there are some of you that have taken the third step in. And you have found a place of service. You're committed. We call you the committed. Because not only are you here regularly on Sunday morning and a part of a Bible fellowship group, and you're here regularly on Sunday morning for worship, but man, you're back on Wednesday night serving in children's choir, serving in Awanas. You're working with student choir. You're teaching Course for Life. You're going on choir tours. You're going on mission trips. Because you have decided to put your gifts, just like Barnabas, you have decided to put your gifts into service by serving other people. And then there are some of you that we call the core. That means you've taken a fourth step. And you not only are serving, you not only are part of a Bible fellowship group, you not only are here every Sunday when we worship, but, but you're part of a small group that meets and just does life in community with people. All of you are not. And we, we were going to begin small groups again out there at the desk in the atrium. There's a sign-up sheet if you're not a part of a small group where you can plug in and be a part of the core. You see, the whole purpose of getting you to a place of maturity in your Christian life is to move you from the crowd to the congregation to the committed to the core. That's where we want everybody to be. And for those of you just, that are just in the crowd, you need to belong to a church, not just come to one. Don't, don't just go to church. You need to belong to one. We want you to connect, we want you to grow, we want you to serve, we want you to fellowship. As one man described it, we want to move you from the living room to the kitchen table in this church. You know, when people come to your house for the very first time, you don't sit down at the kitchen table probably and pour them a cup of coffee and talk to them. No, you sit, you sit in the living room. Because there's, you're glad they're there, but there's just not a level of comfort. There's not a level of familiarity. But after they come over a course of time, Man, you, you sit down at the kitchen table with that person and you drink a cup of coffee and you just do life together. We want to move you from the living room to the kitchen table, from the crowd to the core in this church. Then build them into mature Christ followers. Four key words. Preach, teach, serve, and just... Speak about Jesus. That's the four. Four key words. Now, three prayer requests. Again, we're just talking about us this morning. Three prayer requests. <clears throat> KUC's ministry, finances, revival and awakening. Let me talk to you about that. Over 70 children and their families come into our door every day. Under the direction of Sherry Rutledge, we have the best preschool and daycare in town. The curriculum is biblically based. It focuses the children's attention on Jesus. We tell them every day how much they are loved. We teach them the things of God. If you're looking for a place to serve, call Sherry. She can plug you in at Kids Under Construction. That's what KUC stands for, Kids Under Construction. Because not only are they, we all are under construction. And so, would you pray? Here's the prayer request. Pray that we can connect the families that come in our door every day. Pray that we can connect them and get them connected to people in the life of this church. Those that don't have a church home, and there are many that don't have a church home, pray that we can reach out to them and show them the love of Christ. Pray that we can come up with practical ways to connect, again, the over 70 children plus mom and dad or mom or grandparents that come into our door every day. Pray that we can get them involved. Show them Jesus' love. Second thing you need to pray about is our finances. Last year, our budget receipts were 1131000 
$1,131,000 came out of your pockets and landed on Melody's desk last year. And she's vacationing in Hawaii today because of that. <laughs> no, no. Let me tell you this. That's the highest receipts in the history of the church. Never before had in one budget year we took in $1,131,000. Wow! You are a generous group. So here's what we did in 2015. We set the budget at $1,160,000. Thinking you would do the same thing and even more that you did this year than you did last year. And you didn't. And you didn't. If, if we run normal Sundays between now and the end of the year, if we run normal Sundays, then we are going to receive about $1,070,000. In other words, we're not going to be at $1,130,000 again. We're going to be about $1,070,000. But the budget's $1,160,000, so as you can see, we're going to be about $90,000 short of what the budget requires. That's about a 10% reduction from what the budget requires. And so as we're preparing 2016's budget, and we're in that process right now, we're asking ministries to be cut by 10%. You can't do the same thing you did this year because we didn't get the money. And so... And so we're asking every ministry to cut itself 10%, thinking that next year, if we do the same we did this year, we're going to take in about a million sixty thousand, and that's about 10% less than last year's budget, and we'll be okay. But you want to have some hard discussions? You want to, you want to witness some agonizing and gnashing of teeth? You sit down with the missions team and the property team, you sit down with Eric and his youth ministry and Fred and his music ministry and Shannon and his education family ministry and try to cut 10% out of that. The decisions are hard to make. Hard to make. I sat down last week with the missions team under the direction from the finance team to cut 10% out of the missions budget. That's hard. It's hard to do. Nobody around the table wanted to do it. Nobody. But we did. So you need to pray about the finances. Harvest Day will be November the 1st. First Sunday in November. For the last several years, it's been Harvest Day. Harvest Day will be Sunday, November 1st, where we attempt to just give a love offering to, to the Lord Jesus for all He's done and blessed us with. You pray. Also, as part of our finances, we're, we're in a capital improvement campaign. We have an aging building. We have walls that need painted, and we have air conditioners that break, and sometimes they break faster than we can budget money for them, and so we entered into a capital improvement campaign. We have $460,000 worth of stuff we want to do in the next two to three years. Some of you have been faithful, faithful, faithful to give above your tithe, and thank you, thank you for doing that. We have received about $60,000 toward the $460,000 that we need to take care of these buildings that are aging. And if the Lord would lay it on your heart to give above your tithe, don't you cut from your tithe, but above your tithe, could you give to a capital improvement campaign, capital improvement projects? And if you need to know the specifics of what they are, call me, call Jerry Holter. We'd be glad to talk to you about what they are. Pray about our finances. Then the third thing we want you to do is, is pray about revival and awakening. I preach that to you all summer long. The Lord's going to do something in this community this fall. Prayer on the square was tremendous. You know, let's say somebody said we had 600 people there. Somebody said we had about 800 people there. A couple of Baptist preachers said we had about a thousand people there last Sunday night. 
I, I, I don't know how many were there last Sunday night. I was on the, was on the street and couldn't see much past the, the, the row of chairs that we set up. I do know we had 235 chairs set up. I do know there were a lot of people here to my left in their lawn chairs. And there were a lot of people here to my right in their lawn chairs. And they were up all over the square, but I, I didn't see them. But listen to me, folks. It was a wonderful thing that the, this community could come together. It was a wonderful thing that the unity of the body of Christ could be displayed in that way last Sunday night. But that is just the beginning of what the Lord wants to do in this place I can believe that with all my heart there's already been talk about planting a youth prayer on the square in October we're looking at that and the pastors are also looking at doing a community wide revival in November for three nights on a Saturday a Sunday and a Monday November 21, 22 and 23 a Saturday night a Sunday night and a Monday night coming together again is just God's people and this time Trying to see people come to know Christ as, as their Lord and Savior. Last Sunday night, I challenged people to come to meet me at noon in the gazebo on the square to pray. I didn't know whether anybody would show up at all. I got a text from Joe Kuehl on Tuesday morning that said, I'm coming. So I knew there would at least be two people there. It's Tuesday at noon. There were 28 people there Tuesday at noon. They just gathered to pray. We were there about 20 minutes. What encouraged me the most was that there were more men there than there were women. Yay! It's easy to get women to a prayer meeting. It is hard to get men to a prayer meeting. But there were more men there Tuesday at noon. If you don't have anything to do Tuesday at noon, meet me at the gazebo. I'll be there every Tuesday at noon. You can stay five minutes. You can stay 50 minutes. You can stay all afternoon if you want to. But we're going to pray for an awakening and a revival to come to this community. Three prayer requests. KUC's ministry our finances, and revival. Two ordinances. Two ordinances to understand. The first ordinance is this. Baptism. Baptism. You saw that this morning. Baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. It also pictures the believer's death to sin, the burial to an old way of life, and resurrection to walk in a new way of life. The the Lord Jesus and the Scriptures command us to be baptized, not in order to be saved, but as a testimony that you are saved. And so, baptism is obedience, and it is your public, initial public confession of faith in the Lord Jesus. Who ought to be baptized? Every believer in Jesus Christ should be baptized. When you should you all be baptized? As soon as possible after you place faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Baptism. And then the second ordinance to understand is Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. We're going to do that next Sunday morning right here in our morning worship service. We're going to gather around the Lord's table and observe the Lord's Supper. It's also an act of obedience. Not in order to be saved, but to, not in order to receive saving grace again. But by observing the supper, we memorialize the death of Jesus and anticipate His second coming. We believe the bread symbolizes, represents the body of Christ. And the fruit of the vine symbolizes and represents the blood of Christ. And so when we gather around the table, we remember the body of Jesus Christ, given for us as a sacrifice for sins. And when we gather around the table, we remember the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for us to cover our sins. For the Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We're not told in Scripture how often we ought to do it. Some churches do it every Sunday. We're not told how often we ought to do it in Scripture. We... We do it here at First Baptist Church between four and six times a year. That's probably not nearly enough. But we'll observe it next Sunday morning. Right here. Four key words. Three prayer requests. Two ordinances. And now one main task. We exist to bring Jesus to people. And then build them into mature Christ followers. We exist to bring Jesus to people. Not bring people to Jesus. But bring Jesus to people. In other words, we have to go where people are. We have to go and take Jesus to them. That is why we support other places where the gospel is 
being preached. It's why we started the gathering. It's reaching people who we hadn't reached yet. That's why we're standing alongside J.P. Job and the Good Hope Family Fellowship down there on Highway 115. We support his work because his church is reaching people that we can't reach. We should be trying to bring Jesus to people in as many ways as possible, in as many places as possible, because that is our mandate and that is our calling. We exist to bring Jesus to people because people need the Lord. People need Jesus in their lives. It's the only hope for a broken world and He's the only hope for a broken life. Sir, ma'am, student, you need Jesus in your life. In just a moment, we'll give you an opportunity to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we'll stand and sing a hymn of invitation and invite you to come and find the only hope for your broken life, the only hope for your broken family, the only hope is Jesus. Now listen to me. Because I've been asked this question. Why do you give an invitation every Sunday? Why do we have an altar call every Sunday? How else would you know to pick up your purse and your Bible and put them under your arm if we didn't? We give an altar call every Sunday for you to respond. To respond by coming forward and kneeling and doing business with the Lord. To respond by joining our church. And most importantly, to respond by coming to give your life to Christ. Let me tell you why we give an invitation every Sunday. Because it seals the decision in your heart and life. There's something about you coming forward during an invitation time and taking the hand of a pastor and praying with them or coming to this altar and, and, and praying with them. That, and then you go back to your seat and you can look back to that day and you can say, it is on that day that I went down and came and recommitted and rededicated my heart and life to the Lord. Sure, you can do it right where you stand. But there's something about it that seals it in your heart and life and draws a line and says from this day forward, I'm going to be different if you come down an aisle and kneel and do business with the Lord. It seals the decision in your heart. Second thing does, it strengthens other believers. It gives somebody else. Nobody wants to be first. Nobody wants to be the only one that came. And so there might be somebody else that needs to come and they see you come and they get strengthened to do the same thing. You don't know how many times I've stood at the back door and people shake my hand going out and they said, Pastor, I needed to come down this morning. I almost came down, prayed. There's something going on in my life and I just needed to come down and do some business with the Lord at the altar, but I didn't. I needed to, but I didn't. Well, I, why, why didn't you come down? Well, I, I, just, I just don't know what other people think about me if I went down. Really? I mean, we've reached that point? To where if somebody comes to this altar and kneels and prays and does ministry with God, that you're going to go home and talk about them at lunch? Wonder why they came down. Well, I heard this. Well, you know what? I really heard this. That's why you don't come. Because you're, I've heard it from you. You tell me this. Because I don't, I don't know what those other people are going to think if I came forward. Wow. Here's what they ought to think. Praise God they came down. How can I pray for that person? I need to do the same thing. It strengthens other believers. It should. And then the last thing is, well, it's really the next to the last thing. But the third reason is it changed the devil. 
It shames the devil. You saw the movie War Room. I loved it. You saw that movie, Clara, the old lady in that movie, Clara, where you just started jumping up and down and shouting, the devil just got a butt kicking, the devil just got a butt kicking, the devil just got a butt kicking. When you come down an aisle, the devil gets a butt kicking. Because it shames the devil when you come. But let me show you the best reason. If you want to turn to it, it's Revelation chapter 22. If you, want, if you don't want to turn to it, just listen. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come! And let the one who hears say, Come! And let the one who is thirsty, Come! And let the one who desires the water of life without price. You know the best reason we give an invitation every Sunday is because the last word in this holy book is come. Come. Come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit says come as the church, the bride of Christ. We say come. The last word in this holy book is come come everybody who's thirsty come everybody who cannot find satisfaction in your soul everybody who can't find anything to satisfy the hunger in your heart you've tried everything else sir you've tried everything ma'am it is time that you came to Jesus Come, come, the Spirit and the Bride say come. Let's bow. Father, we, we, we've heard a lot of stuff today from your heart, through my lips. To these people I love. A lot of information about what you're calling us to do and be as your people. Things we need to pray about. Things we need to seek your face about. Things we need to understand. Father, I pray that you're that your spirit was, has spoken to every person. You won't let us forget. What you, through the Spirit of God, has challenged every individual person to do. Whether that be just move one step inside from the crowd to the congregation. From the congregation to the committed. From the committed to the core. Or Father, maybe we just, you've called some to get on their knees and pray about KUC's ministry, about the financial situation in the life of our church, about, about a revival and awakening taking place in this community. Maybe, Father, you've spoken to some about coming to Christ today as their Lord and Savior. I don't think we sang Amazing Grace by accident, Father. I think you spoke to somebody's heart when we sang Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Father, for Amazing Grace. And I pray that that one that you spoke to, Father, would come. That two, those three, would come and trust Christ today. It's in His name I pray.